anyway. This is next to last week, but I've just started recording. Uh, you, you do have uh, till May 3rd to take your finals. I believe uh, it's scheduled for that weekend of um, for the proctored final. So yeah, May 3rd, you can do it. Um, you don't have to schedule it like you did before um, because you're going to take it on honor lock. Uh, so you have from um, May 1st to May 3rd to take it. So for the reproductive system, um, we'll go through the mail a little more quickly. Um, so you do need to know some of the basics that you already, I'm sure, know that sperm are the gametes in males, the ova are the eggs in the females, and what's produced from the union of those develops into a zygote, and that's what we're going to start talking about next week for chapter 28. And you need to know the names of the gonads, which I'm sure we all know by this point in our lives. So the gonads for the males are the testes. The gonads for the females are the ovaries. And what I've written down here is the term haploid. And this term you kind of are going to have to know for this chapter and also for chapter 29. There's not that much that's going to be on your test from chapter 29 but um, there's a little bit of basic heredity. And it's important for you to know that the gametes both are haploid. And haploid means that there are 23 chromosomes instead of the normal 46 that we have in all of our non-sex cells. So that means all the cells that are outside of our gonads are going to have 46 chromosomes. But the gamete is only gonna have 23 chromosomes. So that is pretty easy math. It should make sense to all of us that if the sperm is going to add 23 and the female ova is going to add 23, that's going to give us 46 chromosomes for the zygote. So um, our next slide is, is kind of really just talking about the same thing I've already mentioned, that the gonads are the testes and ovaries and they produce, produce these gametes. And in addition to the production of the gametes, um, you learned back during the endocrine system that was, there was something called mixed organs. And a mixed organ is an organ that has both an endocrine function as well as an exocrine function. And exocrine means that it exits out of the body. So the ovaries and the testes would be examples of these. The endocrine function for the male would be the fact that it produces testosterone. For the female, the endocrine function is that it produces estrogens and also progesterone. And then the exocrine function would be the production of the gamete, the sperm or the ova. So for the male, you should know the accessory reproductive organs, and we'll go through those next. And um, actually in a couple slides, but these are gonna include ducts, glands, and the external genitalia. Basically the, um, kind of the plumbing by which the sperm is going to travel from the testes when it's ejaculated. So our next slide is now showing us what happens at the brain level the endocrine level. And this may look familiar from the endocrine system. For the endocrine system, remember that you learned that uh, a lot of times there's a hypothalamus, anterior pituitary gland, a gland in the body, and also maybe a target cell. In this case, what we're referring to is that the hypothalamus, remember that it releases releasing hormones. And in this case, the releasing hormone stands for gonadotropic because it's going to have an effect on the gonads and it's gonadotropin or tropic releasing hormone. Its job is going to tell the anterior pituitary gland to start secreting hormones that specifically affect the gonads. And so those would be LH or FH. LH stands for luteinizing hormone. 
Um, and so I'll write that over here so that you have it. Um, luteinizing is spelled L-U-T-E-I-N-I-Z-I-N-G. And FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone. And what's important to know, first of all, is that these hormones are going to affect both genders, not just the female. But the reason it's the, they're named is from their discovery in the female. So the follicle stimulating hormone, it is going to stimulate the follicles. These are the cells that surround the oocyte, which is the more scientific name for the ova in the ovary. A young woman is born with millions of oocytes. And this, again, the cells around that are called follicle cells. However, it also affects the male and its job in the male is spermatogenesis. But what I want you to do to help you remember this is that if you remember that FSH, it doesn't matter whether it's in the male or the female, it's going to cause the formation or the development of either a sperm or an egg. Whereas LH is going to cause ovulation in the female and it causes the secretion of testosterone in the male. So this is kind of a, a difficult part to remember of the reproductive system, but it's going to affect both the male and the female. So whether it's the male or the female, the haploid gamete has to develop. And that happens in a process called meiosis. And there's other, other parts of meiosis in your book, but really what is important to know is the generalities, the comparisons between mitosis and meiosis, and to know what happens in each. So first we're gonna look at the overview of meiosis. So I'm gonna zoom in on this part of the chart. And this is what you learned way, way, way back in AAP1. You learned about mitosis. So mitosis is going to be just the exact copying of a cell. We have mitosis that's going on in all of our cells constantly. It's how, it's how new cells develop. So if a cell is damaged in the skin, there's deeper cells that are growing to replace those cells. But the bottom line is that the cells begin as diploid and diploid is 2n and that means there are 46 chromosomes so you should be able to for the test know that diploid is represented by 2n and so after the conclusion of mitosis each daughter cell is going to have the same amount of chromosomes so mitosis is going to have um, you may remember prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, but the end result is diploid. So each daughter cell is identical to the parent cell. And I never really figured out why they don't say the son cells, but it's probably better to say the daughter cells. There's probably a, a reason for that. But um, anyway, each daughter cell is going to be the production from that parent cell. Now, when we look over to meiosis, Meiosis is a little bit different in that the result is half the amount of chromosomes. So there are cells that are in the um, testes or in the ovary that start out with 46 chromosomes. And that means that they are 2N. What happens is that there is mixing up of the chromosomes and the mixing up of the chromosomes, one of the ways that this happens is with what's called a tetrad. And a tetrad simply means four chromosomes. So if we look closer here, we see um, four different chromosomes. And what happens is the chromosome material kind of swaps itself and it's exchanged. So this means that every gamete is gonna be different. 
I always like to say that the formation of gametes, it's kind of like going to the roulette wheel in Vegas. You're kind of spinning the roulette wheel. You never know what you're going to get. It's the same with gametes. You don't know whether gamete A is going to have a certain gene for Tourette's. You don't know if it's not. So there's all kinds of possibilities. They could come from the mother or father. So the same four basic um, phases happen, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, but there's two different sections of it. And for those two different sections, you need to know that during meiosis one, this is what's called the reduction phase of meiosis. And let me um, go ahead and get out, get rid of this extra stuff. So a little more clear to you. So the reduction phase is where the chromosomal material is going to be reduced in half. So from 2n to n. It doesn't matter whether you, you don't need to worry about knowing exactly what happens in prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, telophase 1. What's important is to know that the chromosomes are reduced. And again, you have your study guide to look at if you're in an online class, which should be very specific about what you should know. So um, during meiosis two, meiosis two is just like mitosis in that the parent cell is gonna have the same amount of chromosomes as the daughter cell. So in this case, the um, we begin with N and the conclusion is the same amount of chromosomes. So it's N to N instead of 2N to N. So does anybody have questions on that? So that's going to apply to both male and female. The only difference is that we're going to apply specific names to the stages of those cells, whether it's in the testes or whether it's in the ovary. So moving on to the anatomy then of the male reproductive system, um, the male gonads are, of course, the testes, which we've already discussed. So the duct system now, basically the plumbing that um, where the, is where the ejaculated sperm is going to travel begins with the epididymis, that's continuation of the seminiferous tubules, and the seminiferous tubules are the site of sperm formation. And the word for sperm formation is spermatogenesis. The, fur, the, the name for egg formation is oogenesis. So the epididymis then becomes the ductus deferens, also called the vas deferens. That's where they get the term vasectomy from, ejaculatory duct, and then finally urethra. And the accessory glands are going to be these three, and you should know what the functions of them are. For, um, for lecture, as long as you're in an online class, um, those that aren't may be a little different, but um, for you won't see any of the anatomy. You'll see that more for lab, what you need to label. So you should be able to label all the structures that are on here. But as far as the, um, the pathway then for the sperm, the sperm is formed in the testes, then it exits the testes into the epididymis, this structure right here. The epididymis then become, empties into this tube here called the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. I'm just going to underline it. Then that combines with the, um, one of the first accessory gland called the seminal gland or seminal vesicle leading to the ejaculatory duct. The ejaculatory duct travels through the prostate. So this explains why men who have Prostate problems may have problems with ejaculation. Then this combines with the urethra to lead into 
um, the different regions of the urethra. So the next slide is on the scrotum. So the scrotum is going to be the outer skin fascia that's surrounding the testes. And you should know the function of these two important muscles, the dartos muscle and the cremaster muscle. And mainly the purpose of these muscles are to ensure that the scrotum remains three degrees Celsius lower than the core body temperature. So the cremaster muscle is going to elevate the testes and the dartos muscle is going to wrinkle the skin. So after, um, after this uh, scrotum is out in a cold temperature, this would be the automatic adaptation that would happen. So the relationship of the testes to the scrotum and the spermatic cord is, is shown here. I've highlighted the cremaster muscle and the dartos muscle. So you know their functions now. Uh, this is another important adaptation. It's called the pampiniform venous plexus. And what it does is it helps to remove cold air from the testes. Or I'm sorry, I meant to say warm air. Helps to remove warm air from the testes. And it's kind of interesting how, interesting how it does this. It does this because you'll notice that the testicular artery and the testicular vein are in this area. So he can escape into the testicular vein to allow the testes to cool down. So the testes themselves are where the sperm is actually gonna be produced. So you should know that the testes has two layers around it and these layers, or we're gonna see them too for the ovary, but the inner layer is called the tunica albuginea and the outer one is called the tunica vaginalis. So there's sections of the testes and you've probably seen it in lab and each of these sections are what are called septums. And we can see this shown on this diagram right here. And so each septum is going to separate the lobules. So going back to the previous slide, there's about 250 lobules um, and each contains one to four seminiferous tubules. So these seminiferous tubules essentially are extremely long tubes where sperm production happens. So extremely long tubes where sperm production, and you now know that that's called spermatogenesis, where spermatogenesis occurs. So, um, and then the pathway for the, the traveling of the sperm, once, it's, once ejaculation happens, it then moves into the epididymis where it kind of stays until ejaculation. So we see those on this slide. So the sperm is going to mature there's gonna be different phases of the sperm based on where it's located. And that sperm remains in the epididymis. You'll see there's different regions of the epididymis, the body of the epididymis, the duct of the epididymis, and so on. But the sperm remains there until ejaculation. So if a vasectomy happens, then this tube is li ligated and that sperm is still ejaculated, but it's ejaculated into basically no man's land where it's going to be destroyed like any other foreign cell in the body. So about 99.9% .9 of the time, all vasectomies are, um, they are foolproof, but there are certain situations when there are, it doesn't always work. So the epididymis is, 
the site where there's non-modal sperm, they enter and then they pass slowly through at a rate of about 20 days. So they stay there and they mature and they've actually looked at cross sections of epididymis and the seminiferous tubules and they discovered sperm developed at different stages. So then after the epididymis is the ductus deferens, remember also called vas deferens, which then eventually leads to the posterior side of the bladder, expands to form what's called the ampulla, and it joins the seminal vesicle, the accessory gland, to form the ejaculatory duct. And we've already talked about the vasectomy. It's almost 100% effective. There's a very, very small chance it may not be, but it usually is. So the urethra, the urethra, the, the male reproductive system is quite unique in that the urethra is going to convey urine and semen both, but at different times. And it's quite different in the female. So the three regions of the urethra are the region in the prostate, then the intermediate part, a very short part, part called the membranous urethra, and then the spongy urethra, which runs through the penis. So this slide shows this in a little bit more detail. It just shows a different view, but you can see the duct system shown here, leading from the testes, leading to the seminal vesicle, um, and then into the urethra. So the prostatic urethra is what runs through the prostate. The membranous urethra, it's also called the intermediate part of the urethra. It's a very short part. And there's another, a second um, accessory gland called the bulbourethral gland. And then finally, the penile urethra or the spongy urethra is the last part. So penile or spongy urethra both mean the same thing. And what you should notice down here is this shows a cross section of the penis. And there are mainly two sections. The innermost section, which surrounds the, the spongy urethra, is called the corpus spongiosum. But the corpus cavernosum has deep arteries that are within it. So when, when erection happens, there's blood flow that goes to the corpora cavernosa. And you can see the corpora cavernosa shown up on this diagram as well. And the corpus spongiosum is internal, directly surrounding the penile or the spongy urethra. Spongy urethra may help you remember that the spongy um, the spongiosum is directly around it. So the penis is the male copulatory organ, delivers the semen to the female. And so the prepuce or the foreskin is the cuff of loose skin covering the glands penis. Circumcision would be removal of that foreskin. The penis then has what I've already mentioned, these different um, regions. The spongiosum, again, is what surrounds specifically the urethra. And the cavernosa is the, the erectile body where there's blood vessels. And the erection happens when the tissue fills with blood. And that is a parasympathetic response. Whereas ejaculation is parasympathetic. Whereas um, ejaculation is a sympathetic response. And in this case, nitric oxide is going to be released. And so they discovered very early on that when there was more nitric oxide released, that was they, they were looking for a drug that would help the heart to increase blood flow to the coronary blood vessels. But it was kind of an accident that they stumbled on Viagra because they realized that nitric oxide, more blood flow went to obviously a different region of the body. 
So that's always kind of a funny way that, funny example of how there's been a scientific discovery occurring. So the seminal glands or the seminal vesicles, their job is to provide viscous, alkaline, seminal fluid. So it has a little bit of a higher pH and that, that is providing fructose, citric acid, and essentially the purpose of this is to provide the energy for the sperm. Because in order for that sperm to be successful in uh, penetrating the egg, it has to have energy to be able to re reach that area. And it comprises about two thirds, 70% volume of the semen. Other accessory glands include the prostate as well as the bulbourethral gland. The prostate secretes milky, slightly acidic fluid, which makes up a third of the semen volume. And there's a very small part called the bulbourethral gland that plays a very important role. It produces a thick, clear mucus, which is during sexual arousal, so before ejaculation happens. And the, the job of this fluid is to neutralize any acidic urine in the urethra so that it doesn't get into the vagina. So semen is, each two to five milliliters of semen should contain about 20 to 150 million sperm per milliliter. And the characteristics of semen are that it contains ATP for the energy. It uh, can suppress the female immune response because normally the vagina is going to see the sperm or would see the sperm as a foreign invader. And so semen helps to suppress that immune response so that the vagina doesn't just destroy the sperm. So the process of sperm formation now, as you know, is spermatogenesis occurring in the seminiferous tubules. It begins at puberty and adult males make about 90 million sperm per day. And then that continues really until old age. So the histology of the seminiferous tubules, which you um, will probably, or you have seen them in lab. There are cells called uh, Sertoli cells or cystentocytes and interstitial endocrine cells called Leydig cells. And notice that they produce androgens. So we'll see those on this slide. So with a cross section of a seminiferous tubule, this is what we see. And you should know that the cystentocytes are also called Sertoli cells. They're gonna nourish the developing sperm. And then the interstitial endocrine cells are found between the seminiferous tubule, as the word interstitial means. And they're also called Leydig cells and they secrete testosterone. And remember that the function of LH in the male is LH from the anterior pituitary stimulates the testes to produce testosterone. Whereas FSH stimulates the process of spermatogenesis, which we're gonna see coming up. So spermatogenesis, for the, first of all, for the summary of the events that happen here, there are initial cells, which are called spermatogenic cells, and they give rise to the sperm. So the overall steps are first mitosis. And remember that in mitosis, the parent cell has the same amount of cells as the daughter cells. So they're both diploid. However, in meiosis, there is a reduction phase. And then there's a phase which is like mitosis. And some of those phases that you should know are called primary spermatocytes and secondary spermatocytes and then spermatids. And we'll see those on our next slide here. 
So our next slide shows a little bit more of a, a little bit more description of, as far as a visual prescription, or not prescription, depiction, I meant to say. So first of all, this is showing um, a little bit of the seminiferous tubule. So imagine that we were to just look at one side of it. So if this is our seminiferous tubule, the, if we took one section of it and we expanded it, the, on the very edge would be our stem cell. So the stem cell itself would be for pointing to this cell. So that, was, that arrow was just pointing to the seminiferous tubule. But the stem cells are gonna be on the outside. And they are called spermatogonia. And one thing that will help, help, rem help you re to remember this for the male and the female is that when there is gonia involved, when you see that suffix as the end of the word, that's a stem cell. So it's diploid and it has not yet undergone meiosis. So, after puberty, this process is going to happen where mitosis is going to occur. There are um, germ cells or stem, they're also called stem cells that are maintained, but there's also a sperm cell that enters into meiosis. And the first part of meiosis, remember, is reduction division. And that reduction division, um, is going to begin when the primary spermatocyte develops into secondary spermatocytes. So if you can remember that the primary is going to be diploid and the secondary is going to be haploid, that will help you. So primary, and this is going to apply to the female too, the primary is going to be diploid and the secondary is going to apply to haploid. So this is the reduction phase of meiosis. After the reduction phase of meiosis, um, then meiosis two happens. So there's two daughter cells produced from each parent cell. Then spermatids are the final result of meiosis. And meiosis in males is going to be called spermatogenesis. In females, it's going to be called oogenesis. Now, in this case, after the spermatid has been produced, the final, the sperm is not yet ready to be ejaculated. There's got to be some modifications. So for example, this extra cytoplasm has to be removed. And that is called spermiogenesis to form a sperm that is capable of traveling to an egg to fertilize it. So spermatogenesis is shown in this diagram. It's very similar to the last one. The only difference is that it's a little more histology related. But again, it's important to remember primary is going to be diploid. And so we see primary over here with diploid. Secondary is going to be haploid. That is the reduction phase of meiosis. Then meiosis two is just like mitosis. And so since it's just like mitosis, the parent cell and the daughter cells are gonna be exactly the same. So um, I'll zoom in on these, this area just so you can see a little better, but the cystentocytes are the supporting cells. Then the spermatogonium, spermatogonia for plural is the stem cell. The primary spermatocyte is what enters into meiosis and it produces the secondary spermatocytes 
which are haploid now. So that is um, spermatogenesis. And spermiogenesis is going to be the final modification of the sperm. The three parts of the sperm. Um, the head is going to contain the genetic region. The most important part that is going to invade the egg for fertilization. The midpiece is going to be the metabolic region that produces ATP. And the tail is the locomotive region. And the flagellum, the, the only cell in the human body that has a flagellum is the sperm cell. So we can see the modification of the spermatid producing a flagellum. That flagellum continues to grow and develop. There's excess cytoplasm that has to be trimmed off before there is a mature sperm that is ready for ejaculation then. So the summary of events are shown on the next couple slides. And since they're just summaries, I'm gonna just kind of um, flip through them. So one function of the cystentocytes, remember also called Sertoli cells, is that they help to nourish. Um, and they also form this tight junction, which is the blood testes barrier. Because what it does is it prevents sperm antigens from escaping into the blood. Because if they were to do that, the immune system would be activated. That would not be a good thing. Because keep in mind, there's a development of a whole completely new cell, this sperm cell. And that's going to have antigens just like every other cell we have in our body. Just like the red blood cells we have in our body that you learned about a long time ago. So in summary, the spermatogenesis is shown here. Um, I put a couple practice questions on here. So gametogenesis is a more generalized term for um, spermatogenesis or oogenesis. And I'm recording this video, so I will post it. So you, you'll, have, you'll be able to go back and look at this question. And the... Um, this is kind of the, about the breakdown for the test. Uh, there'll be more questions from chapter 27, you know, 28, 29, and then there'll be some from the old modules as well, just so that you know. So our next slide is showing the um, kind of the summary of this relationship between the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the gonad. So, um, the hypothalamus releases GnRH, gonadal um, releasing hormone, gonadotropic releasing hormone, that activates the anterior pituitary, not the posterior, to produce FSH and LH. And FSH, it indirectly stimulates spermatogenesis by causing the cystentocytes, the Sertoli cells, to release these what are called androgen binding proteins to keep testosterone high. So because of all of that, this is gonna cause spermatogenesis to occur. So the main thing to know is FSH causes spermatogenesis in the male. And then LH is gonna stimulate the interstitial endocrine cells to produce testosterone. And testosterone causes other male side effects like the enlargement of the larynx for example so that's why boys will get a deeper voice as they get older other um, male secondary sex characteristics just like in females the estrogen is going to cause female secondary sex characteristics as well so this shows us the various effects of testosterone activity that occurs. So for the female, the are, there are gonna be some similarities. So I'm gonna to try to kind of point those out to help you um, learn, remember these a little better. 
But the ovaries are, of course, the female gonads, and they produce the female gametes, which are the ova, and they secrete sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone. The internal genitalia are going to be the plumbing, essentially, the pathway where the um, ovulated oocyte travels to the vagina. So it includes the duct system, which is the uterine tubes, the uterus, and then the vagina, and then the external sex organs. So we see those shown on this slide. So uh, you'll have models to identify for lab. So make sure that you take a look at those diagrams as well. So for the duct system, the ovulated oocyte is ovulated from the ovary into the uterine tube and fertilization is going to happen usually in this region. So the fertilization would be the union of the sperm and that ovulated oocyte. Once that happens, the zygote is formed and the zygote will eventually turn into an embryo as it continues its path into the uterus. So the, the role of the vagina is of course to, to serve as the copulatory organ to receive the penis where ejaculation is gonna happen then. The cervix is gonna be the base of the uterus. And this is another view of the female reproductive system from a different view. So what I've, I've listed here are the names, I've highlighted the names of the uterus, the walls of the uterus, the inner uh, layer of the uterus would be the endometrium, the middle layer with the muscle is myometrium, and the outer is the parametrium. And the ovulate oocyte travels into the uterine tube. One difference between the male and the female is that there is a, um, an opening right at this area, an opening between the ovary and the uterine tube. So to prevent the oocyte from not going into the uterine tube, the fibria are finger-like projections that help to push it in the correct direction. So the um, first part of the uterine tube is called the ampulla. This is where fertilization is going to occur. And after that, the zygote then develops into different stages. Blastocyst would be one of them that implants in the uterus wall, which we'll talk more about next Tuesday night. So our next slide shows another example of a possible question. So the external opening on the cervix is called the external os. So make sure you renew, review the anatomy. There'll be questions like this on the lecture exam, but of course the lab exam, you're gonna have to identify those. And remember the questions are short answer where you have to type in the question, just like the other exams that you've had in lab. So the ovaries are the gonads where the, over, the oocyte is going to be produced. And the ovary has an outer cortex that houses the forming gametes. That process is called oogenesis. And the hormone that causes oogenesis is FSH. So remember, FSH is the gamete producing hormone in the male and the female. So the ovarian follicles are the tiny sac-like structures that embed are embedded in the cortex. And they contain the immature egg called the oocyte. And it's going to slowly mature. It's going to develop into different stages, like the primary oocyte, secondary oocyte, 
and it's the secondary oocyte which is ejected in the process of ovulation happening. So the uterine tubes, also called fallopian tubes or oviducts, they receive the oocyte and they're the usual site of fertilization. The different regions of them are highlighted here. So during ovulation, the uterine tubes are gonna capture the oocyte. Then the fimbria, they stiffen and help to sweep the ovarian surface. So the next destination now after fertilization happens. So at this point, the zygote is now starting to transform into a blastocyst. It's going to end up developing in the uterus. So the home for the developing embryo is the uterus. And the regions of the uterus are shown here. The most inferior region of the uterus is the cervix. And the cervical canal communicates with the vagina via the external os and with the uterus via the internal os. So the lining of the uterus is shown on this slide and the outermost lining is called the parametrium. It's the outer serous layer. You've heard the term serous layer before. And then the middle layer, the bulky layer, is gonna be the smooth muscle that's going to contract rhythmically during childbirth. So it responds to oxytocin. Endometrium then is going to be the layer which is going to slough off every month. So there, it's, there's simple columnar epithelium on the top of what's called the lamina propria. And the fertilized egg, it burrows into the endometrium. And that fertilized egg, at this point, it's now called a blastocyst because the initial zygote, it starts to go into rapid mitosis and there's further development to the point it's now called the blastocyst where it embeds itself, it kind of burrows or finds a home in the uterus. So the two layers of the uterus are called the stratum functionalis, and it's the functionalis which is gonna to respond to the ovarian cycle, and it's gonna be shed off during menstruation. And then during the next month, it's going to start to regrow, planning to develop in case there is a fertilized blastocyst, fertilized egg, that happens during the next month. So the vagina is going to extend from the bladder, between the bladder and the rectum, extends from the cervix to the exterior, and it also has various layers. The internal layer is going to be stratified squamous mucosa with rugae, that's a term that you heard in the digestive system for the stomach. It's going to have um, stratified squamous cells, which um, are going to be um, shed. So vaginal secretions are normally, they're gonna be acidic in adult females, but they're alkaline in adolescents. And that acidity um, is temporarily going to be um, kind of relaxed during the process of copulation. So the external genitalia here are shown with the, um, technically called the vulva, which includes the mons pubis. That's the fatty area overlying the pubic symphysis that we see here. Then there's the labia majora, the labia minora, and the majora is the counterpart of the male scrotum. So it would be the outer most skin fold and the labia minora would be the internal lying within the labia majora. And the greater vestibular glands, these are going to be homologous 
meaning they're basically the counterpart to the male bobo, bulbo urethral glands. And remember their job was to uh, get rid of acidic urine. In this case, this is going to make the, um, allow the vagina to become slightly more alkaline to allow for entrance of the sperm. So it releases mucus into the vestibule for lubrication. Then of course, there's the clitoris anterior in front of the vestibule. And this is the counterpart of the penis, of the, the glands penis. So it's the um, part that, um, is the exposed portion that is extremely sensitive, just like the glands penis. So also in the female are the mammary glands. And the mammary glands uh, contain the lactiferous ducts, then the lactiferous sinuses, where milk is passed. So in non-nursing uh, women, those are undeveloped. So the um, process is the lobule contains the alveoli, then that leads to the lactiferous ducts, then the lactiferous sinus, and the milk during uh, nursing is then released from the lactiferous duct. So oogenesis is going to begin with the oogonia. So those would be the stem cells, which are diploid. So remember, anything that ends in gonia is going to be a stem cell. Then entering into meiosis one is the primary oocyte. Remember in the male, there was the primary spermatocyte that entered into meiosis one. Then the reduction division happens where the secondary oocyte is now going to be haploid. So diploid to haploid. So what's a little different now for the oogenesis versus spermatogenesis is that in spermatogenesis, meiosis one and meiosis two is completed. However, in oogenesis, what's really interesting and just amazing is that the secondary oocyte, and this is the phase that's going to be ovulated, the meiosis stops in metaphase two. And remember that there's prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So it kind of stops halfway through meiosis two. And it's completed only if fertilization actually happens. So if there is a sperm that successfully gets in through the outer membranes, which we'll discuss next Tuesday, surrounding the oocyte and fertilization happens. So the ovarian follicle is the functional unit of the ovary that encloses a single oocyte. So that's where we get the name follicular cells from. And the granulosa cells are what they're referred to if there's more than one cell pregnant. So the, the names that are referring to the developing follicle cells surrounding the oocyte are the primordial follicle, primary follicle, secondary follicle, and then vesicular or graphene or antral follicle. Also could be called the tertiary follicle. And this is noticeable because there's a fluid filled cavity called the antrum, which is present. So uh, we'll see those shown on this slide. This slide does a great job of showing side by side the development of the follicles with the egg just to the right of it. So before birth, all of the primordial follicles are present and these primordial follicles, they contain primary oocytes, which are arrested in prophase one. So they haven't begun meiosis yet. 
So all little girls are born with all of the oocytes that they're going to use their entire lifespan. So the primary follicle contains the primary, primary oocyte, which developed from an oogonium, like what we saw in the male with the spermatogonium. Now, throughout life until menopause, the primordial follicles begin to grow and develop, and that primordial follicle still has the primary oocyte in it. That primordial follicle becomes a primary follicle, and then a secondary follicle, but both still contain the primary oocyte. So from puberty to menopause, there's basically going to be one follicle that is selected, and this is sometimes called the dominant follicle, it's going to continue meiosis up until metaphase two. And if fertilization happens, if the sperm enters into that egg, then fertilization happens. But keep in mind, it's the secondary oocyte that's actually ovulated, released from the ovary. However, what's remaining is there's still going to be cells, and these cells are basically scar tissue that remains in the ovary. And at this point, it's called the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum, if there's no pregnancy that occurs, it develops into scar tissue called the corpus albicans. However, if pregnancy does occur, the corpus luteum develops into an endocrine organ, which helps to support the development of that embryo. So this slide is showing our comparison of spermatogenesis as well as oogenesis. And one difference is that oogenesis produces one viable haploid ovum. And in the male, there's four viable sperm that can actually penetrate the egg. Another difference is that oogenesis begins in the fetal life but ends in menopause, whereas spermatogenesis begins at puberty, continues into old age. And there's also a different error rate for sperm versus oogenesis. This is one of the reasons that it's much riskier to have a baby closer to menopause, for example. So I know it is 929, but um, I do want to finish the chapter. So um, I would encourage you to stick around if you can. Um, I'll probably be done no later than 950, but I wanted to make sure I got through this because your assignments are due this coming Sunday night. And then next Tuesday night, we'll have our last webinar on pregnancy, growth, development, and then heredity. And again, those assignments are moved a couple days back. You'll see those in your mastering calendar. So be sure to uh, take a look at that. So our next slide is, is showing the difference between spermatogenesis and oogenesis. As we've already kind of seen, the number of gametes is there's going to be four sperm in the male, but one large ovum and two to three small polar bodies in the female, and a lot less secondary oocytes that are going to be ovulated throughout the woman's lifetime versus the male. So the histology of these cells, kind of what you may see in lab or what you may have already seen, is um, an ovary that looks kind of like this. And you should be able to identify these for a lab. For a lecture, you need to know which one is diploid, which one's haploid. And remember that the primordial follicles and really the primary follicle is going to contain primary oocytes. The oogonia are going to be diploid as well. So really, 
oogonia and primary oocytes are deployed. The secondary follicle in early vesicular follicle, they're going to surround the secondary oocyte and that's where we see the presence of an antrum, this fluid-filled cavity. And this fluid-filled cavity is um, where there's going to be the secondary oocyte, which is ovulated, which is what we see here. But in stage six and seven, this is the remaining tissue that's left over. So again, the corpus luteum is going to support the developing embryo. So it's going to provide, um, it's basically going to be, it's going to supply everything that that embryo needs until the placenta is completely formed. The corpus albicans is formed if there is no pregnancy that occurs. So what we see here is what's called the corona radiata. And that it's called this because it looks like an outer crown. And um, incidentally, the coronavirus, it's called that because they've discovered proteins on the outer surface of the virus, which makes it look like an outer crown. And there's two main membranes that the sperm has to penetrate. The outer one is called the corona radiata. The inner one is called the zona pellucida. So those are membranes around the secondary oocyte that has been ovulated. So we next see the stages of follicle development and there's a preantral phase when there is no antrum that's present and there's an antral phase that's stimulated by FSH and LH because LH is gonna be responsible for ovulation and FSH is responsible for development of that secondary oocyte. So the stages of development are shown here on these next couple slides. So the, and we saw that on that previous slide on the diagram. And so again, the secondary follicle becomes the vesicular follicle the isolated secondary oocyte has surrounding granulosa cells called the corona radiata, sits on the outer stalk on one side of the follicle. And then during ovulation, um, after that oocyte has been ejected, that ruptured follicle translates into a gland structure, which is essentially what the corpus luteum is. It's a gland that's going to support the developing embryo, which is what I have written on the screen, endocrine gland to nourish the developing embryo. So during the, in the ovarian cycle, it's a monthly cycle, obviously, you know, not always, um, doesn't always work on the, the ovulation day, isn't exactly 14 days, but that's the example that we use um, in these few slides. But remember, um, LH causes ovulation, so it's very important to remember. And when we look at the ovarian cycle, the first half of it is called the follicle phase, the follicular phase, and the second half is called the luteal phase. And it's called that primarily because that's when the corpus luteum is going to develop during that phase. So during the follicular phase, this kind of describes what's happening. This is where one dominant follicle is going to be especially sensitive to FSH. So it kind of makes sense that it's called follicular phase because FSH, the FSH levels then they drop around the middle of the follicular phase. The primary oocyte, it completes meiosis one to form the secondary oocyte. And we see these coming up on the next few slides. So this describes ovulation. So the second half of the ovarian cycle is the 
luteal phase. And again, this is called this because of the corpus luteum. It's going to be secreting progesterone and some estrogen. So again, its job is to produce hormone to sustain pregnancy until the placenta takes over. And that's been event about the first trimester, the first three months of pregnancy. And so we see the events that are shown on, um, they're shown here from the brain are the release of FSH and LH, kind of like what we like what we saw in the male. So the LH, um, when it's released, it's going to uh, be responsible for ovulation, and it's eventually going to increase the amount of estrogens. The re the reason we see androgens here, we know those are male sex hormones, is because those are converted to estrogens. It's really interesting. There's a there's an enzyme called aromatase which converts testosterone to estrogen. Uh, so LH is responsible for ovulation, and then FSH is going to select the dominant follicle to start developing. And as it becomes more mature, around mid cycle, there's an LH surge, a release of LH from the anterior anterior pituitary gland, which causes that secondary oocyte to be ovulated. And then what's remaining in the ovary is the corpus luteum, the gland that's going to produce progesterone, estrogens, and a hormone called inhibin. So that's all described in the rest of this slide here. Then we see the hormonal regulation of the ovarian cycle. There's a negative feedback that's inhibiting, inhibiting more gonadotropin release. Positive, the positive feedback is gonna stimulate gonadotropin release. So for example, to um, trigger an LH surge. So one of the reasons that there might be a negative feedback system is if there's a low amount of egg production. Just the same way as in a male, if there's a low amount of sperm production, if the male has a lower sperm count, this is going to trigger the events from the hypothalamus, GnRH, and then FSH, because again, remember FSH causes development of the gamete. So the LH surge is going to trigger ovulation formation of the corpus luteum. The, um, these are just kind of the summary of those events that are happening. So the ovarian cycle, that is simply going to be the events that are happening in the ovary, but there's also going to be simultaneous events that are happening in the uterus at the same time. And those events are called the menstrual cycle as well. And that's because this is where the specific endometrial cells are going to be sloughed off each month. So it's really helpful if you can kind of relate these different charts that are in this chapter to each other. And we'll see that in just a couple slides. So the first few phases of the menstrual cycle are the menstrual phase when there is bleeding. Then there's the growth phase where the endometrial cells are developing pre-ovulation. Then there's the secretory phase, the post-ovulatory phase, which is also the luteal phase in the ovarian cycle, which we'll see coming up here. So this is the rest, just more description of the uterine menstrual cycle shown here. But what I really want you to look at is if you can compare these events and see how they all overlap. So what we're looking at first in letter A is the fluctuation of the gonadotropins of the LH and the FSH. So we see an increase of FSH early on during the follicular phase. 
So even though this is the um, gonadotropin, gonadotropin levels, you should know that it is the follicular phase. So the phase before ovulation is the follicular phase. The phase which is post ovulatory is the luteal phase, which we see in the ovarian cycle. So during the ovarian cycle, we see the follicular phase labeled here. And you can see that there is a follicle that is selected. And when it's most mature, these are the different names which describe it tertiary, graphene, vestibular, antral. Unfortunately, there's four names for it, which is kind of annoying. But right after that, ovulation is going to occur. And ovulation is triggered by LH. That's why there's a huge increase in LH right in the middle of the ovarian cycle. And then what results is the corpus luteum. And again, the corpus luteum is going to be maintained if pregnancy happens. But if it doesn't, then it's going to degenerate into what's called the corpus albicans. And the corpus albicans is scar tissue. So they've looked at ovaries of postmenopausal women, for example, or older women, and they've seen these. The, the scar tissue from all of the secondary oocytes that have been ovulated throughout the lifetime of that woman. So there's also plasma levels of estrogens and progesterones. These are the hormones released from the ovary. And this is finally showing the phases of the uterine cycle. So the menstrual phase and the proliferative phase all cor correspond to the follicular phase, whereas the secretory phase corresponds to the luteal phase. So it's helpful if you can overlap these four phases and realize that simultaneous events are happening from the ovary and then also from the uterus and from the brain. So the effects of the estrogens and the progesterones are shown here. Some of the secondary sex court characteristics, for example. And then the next few slides are showing examples of what estrogen does, progesterone does, and testosterone. Kind of compares them in a chart-like manner. And then developmental effects, aspects of the reproductive system, what we've already kind of talked about is that the X chromosome is much larger uh, than the Y chromosome, but it's all about the sex chromosome, which determines the gender of the baby. So as you all know, two X's forms a little girl and an XY produces a male. So that's why they say it's the really the, the Y, y um, sperm that's going to determine the, whether what the gender is going to be. So we'll talk a little bit about how that's determined. There's some very basic heredity that you'll need to know for uh, chapter 29. But what we see here is the little girl, it's a real cute image of two X's, um, in this case, the sperm, it can, it can contribute either an X or a Y. So in this case, it produces, contributes an X. So two X's leads to a little girl. It, however, if the sex chromosome from the sperm is a Y, then a little boy is produced. So of those 23 chromosomes, from the gametes, 22 of them are what are called autosomes. That means they don't have anything to do with determining sex, but the X or the Y is the one sex chromosome. The other developments that are important for the 
um, reproductive system are that the FSH and the LH start to become elevated at birth. They drop and then they start to increase at puberty. And then finally at menopause, there's really no equivalent to menopause in males. However, there is some evidence that they kind of refer to low testosterone in males as male menopause. But um, unfortunately, uh, females have menopause and these are some of the side effects of this. So that concludes chapter 27, but I wanted to make sure that we got through all of it tonight so that you have prepared to um, do your chapter 27 assignments. So with that, um, I'm going to stop.